Howdy folks, Dave here at Thunder Mesa Studio, where this week I'm working on a new structure build for the ON18 Bandit Canyon Railway layout. This is going to be the largest structure on the layout and will represent a fairly typical gold and silver stamp mill from the late 19th century American West. And as you can see, I've already built a mock-up for it. The cardstock mock-up was built to fit the space I created when I made Six Gun Butte and to make sure that the mass and all the measurements would be accurate when I built the actual model. This mill is a little unusual and not exactly prototypical in that the trains are going to pass right through it, entering through the rock tunnel on one side and exiting the mill on the other. In fact, it's really just another piece of scenery for the train to pass through. Much like the blackjack mine that I built previously, this new structure will be an artistic themed caricature, like something Disney might build in their parks, with just enough realism salted in to help sell the story. A stamp mill is basically a big rock crusher. It's a place where the raw ore from the mine comes in one end, uh, gets crushed down so that they can separate out uh, the more valuable material from the waste rock, and then the more valuable ore gets bagged and shipped out the other side, usually to a smelter. In the earliest days, uh, the ore was crushed using animal power, oxen, uh, mules, and donkeys. That was replaced by steam engines and the 10 stamp mill. Uh, and then, of course, later they were powered by electricity, which they still are to this day. We're going to be modeling something that looks a lot like a steam-powered 10 stamp mill. Now, with that little bit of history and explanation behind us, let's go ahead and get started on the actual model. Since I want my mill to fit snugly into the rocks over there, I thought it was definitely worth the time to build this mock-up. It, you know, it took a couple of hours, but that gave me all of the, uh, the precise dimensions that I needed to go home then and design uh, some laser cut parts for this. And there's a lot of parts. Uh, I decided to go with an MDF core and have an out exterior cladding of some 1 16th inch thick basswood. And all of the windows and trim pieces and stuff like that are going to be made from some uh, 35 one thousand of an inch thick brown laser board. And we'll get started assembling this with some yellow carpenter's glue. Uh, this is the part down at the bottom that the train passes through. And this is going to be visible, so I've scribed some board detail in there. This is my uh, shoe dye and rubbing alcohol mixture. Amazing how good you can make MDF look with just a little bit of stain. We'll start putting this piece in like so. And this one goes on this side. And this goes into these slots up here. Get everything lined up. Ooh, that was easier than I thought it would be. You can also start assembling this cupola. Now this back piece locks in and ties the whole thing together. While the glue dries on this core, I'm going to go ahead and paint all of the exterior cladding. And I want that to be kind of a red oxide, so I'm just going to use some flat red enamel primer. But wait, actually before I paint these, just remember I want to distress all of these individual boards. Add some additional grain using a uh, fine tooth razor saw. Yeah, I like to take my hobby knife and just swirl it around here and there. Add some knots, knot holes. I also want to add some nail holes where these random planks meet up. All right, now I can get some paint on these. I want the interior of this little pass-through section here to look like it's done with post and beam construction. So I'm cutting and then distressing, and then I'll be staining some uh, eight by eights and six by eights 
just to put in here. And it's just, you know, cosmetic for what can be viewed uh, through the windows and through the tunnel opening. While I wait for the stain to dry on those posts and beams, I can go ahead actually and start putting on the exterior wall cladding in some places. And this is where lots and lots of clamps come in handy. Some down here along the bottom too. And what do we say about clamps? Never have too many. And to make this end wall a little easier, I've decided to cut it into two pieces. That way I don't have to race and get all the glue in where I need it, you know, and get the piece in before the glue dries, etc. I got to get a little more working time this way. And I'll do the same thing over on this side. Now I can start adding the post and beam framing, starting down here with the 8 by 8 footer on the bottom. Get one of these on each side. Next I want to frame in these portals on each end, using the 8 by 8s. I can add these six by eight upright posts. And then these horizontal pieces can go in. Let's see, and this last one right in the middle there. In addition to the six by eight framing on this side, I've also added some two by fours around the interior of the windows because some of that might be visible through the opening here. And the structure is going to have, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 windows. So right now I'm working on doing some uh, pre-assembly on those before I paint them. So here, take a look at this. This inner casement has a couple little slots there. And then this outer one goes over the top. Let's glue that into place like that. And then the panes grab one of these. They'll drop in. See they've got a couple little tabs, one on each side. And those drop in like that. So then when the, the uh, window is in the building, push open like that. Gives it a nice factory kind of look. And the color I'm going to paint all these, all of the uh, window trim, is this uh, Rust-Oleum Ultra Flat a uh, camo light tan, which should look really nice with the red oxide, I think. While the paint dries on the window frames, I'm going to go over all of this with my wire brush, do a little bit of pre-weathering, taking the paint off here and there. In some places you want to you know, scrub real hard, get a lot of the paint off. In some places a little bit lighter. Just want to make sure you're always going with the grain of the wood. You don't want to go against the grain. Now I want to take my wood stain and thin it down with some more 70% isopropyl alcohol. Now I'll use this dark wash and go over the whole building again. Now since I painted this with enamel paint, it's not going to react with this wood stain. I'm not going to reactivate the paint. And you see how that grayed everything down and desaturated the color? That's the look we're after. See it also seeps back into the scribed in detail and makes the boards look more distinct and separate from each other. Now, these aren't windows on the ends. These are actually 
louvered vents. Help get some airflow in there. Stamp mills were a very dusty business, by all accounts. I'm applying a little bit of Zap canopy glue to the back of this window frame. And then I can drop in the clear acrylic glazing and that whole assembly goes into these slots back here. Now before I install this window, I want to uh, really dirty up the window panes. They're, they're way too clean and clear right now. So I'm going to spray the back with uh, some clear matte finish. That's the first step. And I'm going to take some chalks, mostly gray, and dirty up this window. Now I'll give that another spray with the, uh, the matte finish to uh, lock that into place. Now this window frame gets glued into place, just like so. One window down, 11 to go. This is some 1x6 corner trim, which the whole structure is going to get, but I thought I might as well start here on the cupola. Now I've got some roof trusses for this. I just need to stain the ends of the rafter tails where they show. And then this completed roof truss just slots into the top. On these larger windows, the only difference really is that the, um, the bottom panes are fixed. Other than that, they go together in exactly the same way. The upper panes just drop into the casement like that. You can see that. And then you can rotate them. Well, now I'm just finishing up the 1x6 trim, all the corners, and doing some trim here around this portal. But I wanted that to be the lighter tan color. I also want to finish up this man door up here. I added a doorknob made from a track nail. I just finished trimming it out also, some 1x6. Now I can start adding these long rafters. You just slot in up here with the siding and then down into this slot down here. Usually I want a model to be able to be to be able to access the interior from either through the top, through the back, or from underneath, at least somehow to get inside. And this one I'll be able to access from the bottom just by pulling it off the layout. And that means I can just go ahead and build the roof in place and not worry about having it be removable. I'm going to glue all of these roof trusses into their slots on the ridge beam. Now we try to line all of these up, which is always a little bit of a challenge. Boy, I think by Georgia, I think we've got it. Next comes the roof. I've cut some panels for the roof out of some chipboard. And chipboard, if you don't know, is just inexpensive cardboard. It's like the stuff they make cereal boxes out of. And I'm just using my Minwax stain marker, some early American, to stain the parts of it that might show under the eaves. I'm going to start by gluing on this uh, large bottom panel. Applying glue to all of these rafters. And I think I'll do the cupola roof next. I'm leaving a big opening in this part of the roof. And that's so that cupola can slot down in there. I don't need the entire roof to be removable on this model, but I do need that cupola 
to be removable. Um, because with it on there, the building actually sits too high to get in the back of my car for a portable layout. So, you know, rather than have to take the whole structure off, all I'll have to do is just pull that off. I also want to have some big uh, smokestacks sticking up out of this for the uh, steam boiler, etc. But once again, the problem is <laughs> they will uh, stick up higher than will fit if the layout is to be portable. So here's the solution I came up with. This is a piece of uh, 3 16 dowel. I can go up about that high. So that piece of dowel sticks out, and then I've got a Grant Line smokestack, industrial smokestack. It's just going to fit right over the top of that, but I'll be able to just lift it right off. And the solution on this one's a little easier. I can make it as tall as I want since this entire section is removable. Now, a big industrial building like this just kind of screams for corrugated metal roofing. And fortunately, my friend Chris Bonn over at Full Circle Models has sent me some samples of a new product that he wants me to try out. Chris is going into the corrugated siding and roofing business in a big way. You can find Full Circle Models over at fsmkits.com. And he sent me a whole bunch of samples, different materials, uh, cardstock, and some cinefoil, that black cinefoil that I like to use. And you can check those out over on his website. I believe they are available now, and if not, they will be very, very soon. Right now, I've taken mine, the black cinefoil samples that he sent me, and cut them into uh, four by eight scale pieces. He says they're going to be available in uh, eight and ten foot lengths, so that's a nice feature. He recommends the gray cardstock, by the way, but I kind of like this black cinefoil. I'm going to get a coat of paint on this and uh, do some weathering, and then we can actually start adding the roofing to the mill. I'm just going to start with a flat gray primer. Now I'm adding some rust to the panels. And I'm basically just using two colors of paint right now. I've got some burnt umber and some burnt sienna. And these are artists acrylics. And I'm using a, a small flat brush. This one's got a lot of miles on it. And going with the corrugations because I want most of the paint down in between. Unlike dry brushing where you want it up on top, I want this down in between the corrugations. And I'm trying to get some variety here. I don't want all these panels to look evenly rusted. Sometimes you can just dab it on and then pull it down like that. I tend to get more rust down towards the uh, bottom edge. And I'm just simulating that with some more of the burnt sienna, putting some more of that on there. I want kind of a mottled pattern, so I'm just going back and dabbing here and there and pulling it down. And in some spots where I want the rust to be really intense, I'll come back with this is some uh, red oxide, which is almost orange. And I'll just stab the brush down to add some little spots here and there. Now where the rust should be on corrugated siding or roofing is down in the channels for the most part. So I want to go back again and dry brush over the top going across the corrugations. So I'm just hitting the tops of those. So then it'll look like the rust is just down in the valleys, in the channels, where it would naturally occur. And the final step, my final step, before I start gluing these on the building, is to go over some of the panels, not all of them, just some of them, with a dark acrylic wash. This is my black with uh, burnt umber, 
and a lot of water. Use it for a lot of different things. Now it's just a matter of gluing these on in overlapping rows. Sometimes you have to cut them to shape, fit around little details like that, but honestly it's pretty straightforward. I like to overlap them by about a scale foot. I'm using some Eileen's Tacky Glue to put these on. And I just thin it with just a little bit of water, just enough so I can put it on with a paintbrush. It does a nice job, nice fast grab. On the end pieces, I like to leave a little bit of an overhang so I can bend it over the side like that. Over on this side, I've painted it grimy black around the base of the smokestack so that it'll look like flashing when all of the uh, roofing is in place. And then up here at the peak of the roof, I like to take a narrow strip of the corrugated material and you know, fold it over to cap off the roof. It's only about, uh, about five or six corrugations wide. That's really all you need. My paint job on the roof is a little more garish and a little more shiny than I would like. So that means it's time for chalks. Go in and weather the roof with some terracotta, with some brown, some gray. I really want to punch up the rust here and there. Let's take some orange. just kind of naturally falls back into the corrugations where I want it. And I did some dry brushing on these chimneys, but I'm going to hit them with the chalks too. Particularly add some soot down here around the bottom. All right, now I'll hit that with my uh, clear matte finish. And we can start working it into the layout. I've been doing a little prep work over here on the scene where I just finished painting and ballasting the track through here. And I'll be going into how I do all of that in a future episode. But for right now, I want to make some provisions for bringing power up into the mill. So I need to cut down through this foam and drill a hole in the uh, roadbed down there. So to light the interior of the building, I've got four LEDs, one flickering and three non-flickering yellow LEDs. What I found is that a little flicker goes a long way. So these three up here will light the upper part of the building, and this one will bend down to light the lower part. While you guys weren't looking, I built this platform, this landing, and that's going to be affixed to the wall here just below the door. And then there'll be some stairs going down from there. I've also been making some doors that are going to go on the opening there. And to get this trim on the outside, just gluing that on. And then they've got a Z brace on the inside. These doors are not functional. They're going to be glued wide open. But if I was just to glue this into the opening that would be a pretty weak joint so I need some sort of mechanical connection. I'll show you how I do that. Drilled a couple of holes here and then I've got a shirt pin I'll put in here. Now I can trim those off leaving only about you know, maybe an eighth of an inch sticking out. I can use those to mark where to drill the corresponding holes. Like that. I just need to press down put some CA on the ends of these pins, some yellow glue on the edge of the door, and I can just push this in. Now that's not going anywhere. I just do the same for the door on this side. Now I've got some tiny little 
photo etched hinges. And these were in my scrap box. But you can find uh, similar things out of styrene from Grantline. Now I want to add a sign up here to the roof. And I created a graphic in Adobe Photoshop and printed it out. And I just got finished laminating it to some Bristol board to make it a little thicker. And if you're interested at all in this process, I did an entire video on how I do these signs and you know the false fronts of buildings and things like that using Adobe Photoshop. You can check that out. It's called uh, Cordelia's Cafe. I'll put a link to it. Right now I just want to cut this out and once it's all framed in and weathered this is what you get. I also cut some brackets for the back that match the slope of the roof so it'll sit at a 90 degree angle. Now, put the structure into place. Just like that. I built this little retaining wall and these bolt heads are actually shirt pins. All of them are cut off uh, except for the top two and those go all the way through and that's all that's really holding this in place. I've got two shirt pins going through and holding this into the foam so I can pull it right out if I need to and remove the structure. The stairs here are connected to this scenery and not to the building and I have more stairs planned. There's gonna be a landing here and then more stairs down to a whole other scene down here trackside I think with a water tower and some other details but that's all gonna to have to wait for a future installment, future episode. Right now, I am out of time for this week, so I have to wrap up the Sundance Mine. And there's just one more thing I want to add, and that's this guy. He looks an awful lot like old Sundance himself. That's a uh, great little figure from Knuckle Duster Miniatures that was painted for me by Tim Kalinske. Thanks, Tim. And that is another major piece of the Bandit Canyon Railway that is now done. I hope you'll stay tuned for the next installment and everything that's happening here at Thunder Mesa Studio. Please like, subscribe, share, hit that notification bell if you want to see more. You can also follow Thunder Mesa over on Instagram at thunder.mesa and see all that's new on the Thunder Mesa Studio website at thundermesa.studio. And if you really like what we're doing here at the channel and would like to show your support, you can do what these nice folks did and head on over to patreon.com slash thundermesa and show your support there. Until next time, keep moving forward, my friends. Adios for now.